نحمد و نسلی علی رسول الکریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احلل اقدتم من لسانی یفقہ قولی و جعل لی وزیر من اخلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین رب زدنی علما اللہم انی اسألکا علما نافیا رزقا طویبا و عملا متقبلا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ سورہ نوح This was revealed in uh, Mecca. It has 28 verses, two stanzas, 71st by the order of arrangement, and also the 71st by the order of revolution. Uh, this gets, uh, the surah gets its name because uh, in this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained the events in the life of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. And as far as the period of revolution is concerned, it is also one of the earliest surahs to be revealed in Mecca. It was sent down in a period where disbelievers, they, um, they were getting stronger and stronger in opposing Prophet ﷺ. The basic theme of the surah is the story of Hazrat Nuh salam has been related. And the purpose of relating this story here is to warn, to warn all the disbelievers of Mecca, to tell them that see, the people who opposed and who rejected the teachings of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, they were drowned and they suffered a main torment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they all perished. So they are being the people of Makkah who were disbelieving, making fun of all the teachings and messages of Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. They have been clearly admonished and they have been warned. Verses number two to four briefly explains how Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, he began his mission. Then from verses 50 to 20, Allah states how he has been trying to bring his people to the right path and how the people they had stubbornly opposed him. And in verses 21 to 24, final submission, <coughs> the final submission, which was recorded by Hazrat Nuh alayhi salam, that um, it was not just he was just being impatient. He had just realized and he had developed the opinion that there's no chance that these people are going to revert towards the right path. And then finally, in the conclusion, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam's supplication he made to Lord and uh, that uh, the torment descend on the people. And the purpose was to exterminate all forms of idol worship on the earth and to establish the worship of Allah the one almighty bismillahirrahmanirrahim inna arsalna nuhan ila qaumihi an anzir qaumaka min qabli an ya'tiyahum azabun alim qala ya qaumi inni lakum nazirum mubin in ya'budullaha wattaquhu wa atiyuni يغفر لكم من زنوبكم ويؤخركم إلى أجل مسمى Allah says, indeed, we sent Nuh alayhi salam to his people saying, warn your people before there comes to them a painful punishment. He said, oh my people, indeed I am to you a clear warner saying, worship Allah, fear him and obey me. Allah will forgive you of your sins and delay you for a and delay you for a specified term. Indeed, the time set by Allah when it comes will not be delayed if you only knew. He said, my Lord, indeed, I have invited my people to truth day and night, but my invitation increased them not except in flight. And indeed, every time I invited them that you may forgive them, they put their fingers in their ears, covered their mouths with their garments, persisted and were arrogant with great arrogance. So till here we learn the manner and the perseverance in which with full steadfastness and with full determination was Prophet Nu alayhi salam. He was inviting his people towards the truth and towards the righteous behavior and conduct of life. 
And in this verse number seven, we realize that how was resistance, reaction, rejection, refusal, and hostility, it was, uh, it was uh, shown by the people. And despite all this, how perseverantly he carried on. And I invited them publicly also, and then I announced to them, and I also confided to them secretly, and I said, ask forgiveness of your Lord. Indeed, he is ever a perpetual forgiver. So this is from all these verses, we gather how, how the prophets, how the messengers, they invited the people towards the bondsman, towards the creator, and how do all the people inviting, all of us, all of us involved in the activities of Dava, we need to invite. This is how we need to preach, how we need to preach and invite people, everyone, everywhere, every time, inviting with a promise of forgiveness from Allah, encouraging with glad tidings or perceiving forgiveness and the bounties from Allah so that it would convince, it would motivate people to come towards Islam. Hazrat Nuala Islam promised them that if you seek forgiveness, what will Allah do? He will send rain from the sky upon you in continuing showers and give you increases in wealth and children and provide for you gardens and provide for you rivers. What is the matter with you that you do not attribute to Allah grandeur? While he has created you in stages, do you not consider how Allah has created seven heavens in there and made the moon therein a reflected light and made the sun a bright la a burning lamp? And Allah has caused you to grow from the earth, a progressive growth, and then he will return you into it and extract you another extraction. And Allah has made for you the earth an expanse and that you may follow therein roads of passage <coughs> new alayhi salam said my lord indeed they have disobeyed me and followed him whose wealth and children will not increase him except in loss they conspired an immense conspiracy and said never leave your gods and never leave vad sava yahus yauk and nasr these were the idols they had five idols and five gods they had fabricated created and they had started worshiping and already they have misled many and my lord do not increase the wrongdoers except in error because of their sins they were drowned and put into fire and they found not for themselves besides allah any helper <coughs> and Nuh salam said, my Lord, do not leave upon the earth from among the disbelievers an inhabitant. Now, in this verse number 26, Hazrat Nuh salam supplicated that let not any one of them be left and let the whole nation be perished. This was what? This was not Hazrat Nuh salam being revengeful. He was not being revengeful. Instead, this was what? This was a supplication meant to eradicate idol worship, to exterminate polytheism to the finest of extent, and to uproot both completely and perfectly. And that is why he had supplicated this. Indeed, if you leave them, they will mislead your servants and not beget except every wicked one and confirmed disbeliever. My Lord, forgive me and my parents and whoever enters my house, a believer and the believing men and the believing women, and do not increase the wrongdoers except in destruction. <coughs> Surah al muzammil being revealed in Makkah, this has... The surah has 20 verses and two stanzas and is the 73rd by the order of arrangement and third surah. The few verses of this surah, they were the third to be revealed by the order of revolution because the first being revealed are the few verses of surah al-alaq, the second being the few verses of surah al-qalam or surah an-nun and the third revolution being the few verses of surah al-muzammil the fourth being the few verses of surah al-muddasir and the fifth 
the complete revelation of the Surah Al-Fatiha. So Surah Al-Fatiha is the fifth by the order of revelation, but is the first Surah of Quran, which was completely revealed. And uh, regarding the name, obviously, is from the first, uh, the way Prophet Sallallahu has been called and addressed as Al-Muzammil. The period of revolution is regarding the two sections of the, of the surah. They were revealed at two different periods. The first section from verse number one to nine unanimously it is considered as a, uh, as the part which was revealed in Mecca and uh, because we learned that firstly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these first one to 19 verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering Prophet sallallahu alayhi sallam to arise during the night worship and uh, with the purpose with the purpose that he may be able to develop the capacity a capability to shoulder the heavy burdens of prophethood, implying what? That these verses were revealed in a very initial period of the prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And secondly, a command has been given to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Quran to recite the Quran in tahajjud prayer for almost half of the night. So it means that till now, that amount of Quran and the verses of Quran had been revealed. So these two things which have been revealed in the verses from one to nine, they indicate that these initial first part of the surah was revealed in the starting period of uh, the prophethood. And the second section, which is from verse 20 towards the end, this is uh, has been revealed by some. They say that they've been revealed during Medina, but most of the commentators consider that they have been revealed in Makkah because here there is a mentioning of zakat. And according to some commentators, they say that the order for zakat came only in the surahs revealed in Medina, but we do learn that the order for zakat had been uh, issue, issued to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the period of Makkah, but was actually implemented when he migrated to Medina. The theme and the subject matter, the first uh, seven verses Allah, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been ordered to uh, order uh, to uh, worship in the Salat of the Hajjus so that he can prepare himself for the all the heavy burdens which he is going to be put during his mission of prophethood. In verse number 18 to 14, he has been ordered to devote himself exclusively to Allah who is the owner of the universe and bear with patience bear with patience whatever opposition he may have to face to invite people towards the owner of the owner of the universe and then in the verse number 15 to 19 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, all those who have who, who were opposing Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have been very strongly, they have been warned and they've been told that suppose that you you are not being punishment, you are not being punished by a torment of the world, despite the fact that you are refusing to believe and you are continuing to oppose Allah's prophet. So despite the fact that you are not being punished by a torment in this world, you will not be able to save yourself from the punishment of the day of judgment. And uh, in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has repeated that Prophet sallallahu should stay patient in all forms of oppositions he has to face. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhal muzzamilu qumil layli illa qalila nisfahu adhin qusminhu qalila aw zid alayhi wa rattilil qur'ana tartila. Allah says, O you who wraps himself in clothing, arise to pray the night, except for a little, half of it, or subtract from it a little, or add to it and recite the Quran. How? Recite the Quran with a mayyad recitation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to recite the Quran. How? Rattilil Qur'ana tartila. Allah is ordering his beloved Prophet on whom actually were the verses of Quran revealed, in whose memory was what? The verses of Quran had been instilled and entered 
even he is being ordered not to recite the Quran quickly, not to recite the Quran in haste, but to recite it slowly and distinctly. Pause at every verse. Why is he being ordered to do all that? It is what we are being ordered indirectly also to recite the Quran slowly, distinctly, pause at every verse so that the mind understands the meaning and mind understands the purpose of the divine revelation very well. And we take the effect from the verses of Quran also. Like if the verses mention the attributes of Allah, we are all inspired in our hearts with the glory of Allah Almighty. If the verses express the mercy of Allah, our heart may become filled with the feelings of gratitude to the merciful Allah. If the verses mention the wrath of Allah and the punishments of Allah, then our heart will be overwhelmed by the fear of Allah. If the verses enjoin, if the verses enjoin a commandment, a do or don't, then we will, we will comprehend and we will understand what has been enjoined and what has been forbidden. So that is how we need to recite the Quran slowly and distinctly. As Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has also instructed all of us, recite the Quran in the, in the manner of, of the Arabs. And Allah says, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that Allah likes the recitation of Quran made in the manner in which it was revealed. Prophet said, Husn al Quran bi aswatikum. And Prophet has also informed all of us, who does not recite the Quran in the proper dialect, in the proper pronunciation, in the proper way, it has to be recited in the way it was revealed. They were not from among us. And to get Guidance from Quran, we need to recite it the way it has to be, and it was supposed to be recited. Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, mentioned in the Quran, Allazina Ataina Humul Kitaba Yatlunahu Hakkatilavatihi Ulaika Yominuna Bihi. Those who will believe in Quran will be those who recite it the way it is supposed to be recited, the way it is rightfully to be recited. How did Prophet recite the Quran? Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was asked how Prophet sallallahu recited the Quran and he said that Prophet sallallahu used to stretch the words while reciting them. For example, when he recited Bismillah rahman rahim he would prolong the sounds. Bismillah. And then he would say Ar-Rahman. And then he would say Ar-Rahim. And this has been reported in Bukhari. Similarly, Hazrat Umay Salma radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was asked the same question and she replied that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he recited every verse separately and distinctly and observed a pause. Like as if he said, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Then he paused and he recited, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And then he paused and he recited, Maliki Yawmiddin. In another, in another tradition by Hazrat Umay Salma, anha, she stated that Prophet Sallallahu recited each word distinctly and clearly, rather than jumbling up the words altogether. Similarly, Hazrat Khuzaifa bin Yaman, anhu, he reports that once I stood beside Prophet Sallallahu in the night prayer to see how he recited the Quran. And I noticed that he glorified Allah where he should be glorified. He invoked and supplicated to Allah where he should be invoked and supplicated. And he sought the refuge of Allah where his refuge should be sought. And it has been reported in Muslim and Nisai. Similarly, Hazrat Abu Zar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he explains that I was, um, uh, he explained that Prophet sallallahu was reciting a verse in Tu'adhibhum, that these are your bondsmen. And if you punish them and if you befall them with a torment, they are your people. Then Prophet وسلم, he kept on repeating it over and over again until it became dawn. It has been reported in Mustad Bukhari and uh, Mustad Ahmad and Bukhari. So this was the the method of recitation and the manner of recitation of Prophet وسلم, when he recited the Quran. So making the recitation of Quran very in haste 
and doing it in indecent haste is not advisable. It is not ordered by Quran and it is against the Sunnah of Prophet ﷺ himself. Indeed, we will cast upon you a heavy load. Indeed, the hours of night are more effective for concurrence of heart and tongue and most suitable for words. Indeed, for you by day is prolonged occupation. And remember the name of your Lord and devote yourself to him with complete devotion. He is the Lord of East and West. There is no deity except him. So take him as a disposal of your affairs and be patient over what they say and avoid them with gracious avoidance and leave me leave me with the matter of the deniers and those of ease in life and allow them respite a little and allow them respite a little indeed with us for them are shrekles and burning fire and food that chokes and a painful punishment on the day the earth and the mountains will convulse and the mountains will become a heap of sand pouring down indeed we have sent you as a messenger as a witness upon upon you just as we sent pharaoh a messenger but pharaoh disobeyed the messenger so we seized him with a ruinous caesar then how can you then how can you fear if you disbelieve a day that will make the children white haired, the heaven will break apart therefrom. Ever is his promise fulfilled. Indeed, this is a reminder. So whoever wills may take to his Lord away. Indeed, your Lord knows that you stand in prayer almost two thirds of the night or half of it or one third of it. And so do a group of those with you. And Allah determines the extent of the night and the day. He has known that you Muslims will not be able to do it and has turned you and has turned to you in forgiveness. So recite what is easy for you of the Quran, he has known that there will be among you who are ill and other traveling throughout the land, seeking something of the bounties of Allah and other fighting for the cause of Allah. So recite what is easy from it and establish prayer and give zakah and loan Allah a goodly loan. And whatever good you put forth for yourselves, you will find it with Allah. It is better and greater in reward and seek forgiveness of Allah. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Rabbi Khfir Warham wa Anta Khairul Rahimin. Surah Al Mudathir. This surah was revealed in Mecca. It has 56 verses, two stanzas, 74th by the order of arrangement. And as I have already explained that a few of the verses of Surah al mudassir were revealed by fourth by the order of revelation. The Surah takes its name from the word al mudassir in the first word where Prophet Wasallam has been called and addressed, calling him out as al mudassir And regarding the period of revolution, the first seven verses of the surah, they belong to the earliest period being the fourth uh, according to the order of revolution. And uh, the I repeat again, the first few verses of surah al-alaq. They were, we, uh, we relate, we, <coughs> we relate by these four verses that after the first three verses of Surah Al-Alaq and Surah Al-Qalam and Surah Al-Muzammil, after their revelation, these uh, revelation to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were stopped for some time. They were halted for some time. The process of revelation was stopped for some time and uh, it remained suspended for quite some time. And during all this time, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in a state of deep grief and distress. He was upset and he thought that most probably he started having different assumptions. He had, he assumed that most probably Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been displeased with me or the prophethood or the source of guidance has been taken away from me. And there were multiple things which were coming to him in his mind and he was assuming things and he was extremely upset and he was deeply grieved and distressed. And he used to 
he said that he stated in different traditions we learn that he used to go to the top of mountains and he used to feel like throwing himself down and then there was a similar day that prophet sallallahu said that after this period this fatratul wahi the suspension of revolution for some time he it has been reported in bukhari and muslim that he says that one day i was on the top of a mountain and i was feeling like as if i wanted to throw myself down but then i saw that there was a shade and there was a shadow above me on the mount on the on the sky and i looked up and i saw and i suddenly heard a call from the heaven and i raised my head and i saw that there was the same angel who had visited me in the cave of hira and um, as a jibril al-islam prophet al-islam reports that he was sitting in on a throne between the heaven and the earth and his wings were filling all the space between the heaven and the earth and this stuck this struck terror in my heart and he reached home quickly and he called hazrat khadija radhiyallahu ta'ala anha and he was calling out what he was saying zambiluni zambiluni cover me up cover me up and so the people of the house covered me up with a quilt or a blanket and that time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he sent down the revolution ya ayyuhal mudassiru so from here prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that from here on revolution became intense and continuous and this has been reported in bukhari and muslim musnad ahmad and ibn jarir also so this is the whole narration of the first few verses were revealed when after a period of suspension of the revolution and we learn from here the manner of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we all know how how heavy and how difficult the process of revolution for prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was as has been reported by hazrat aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala and how she says that when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the revolution used to descend on prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it was so difficult and hard on him physically that because of the load of all that what used to happen was that he used to start sweating and sweat used to start pouring from his forehead and then it was so difficult has isma bint yazid radhiyallahu ta'ala and how she explains that i saw prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was atop a camel a she camel and there there was a revolution started on prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and i saw that the she camel badly started swaying here and there and the legs of the she camel started shivering and trembling with the load and the weight which prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was bearing so this was this was how how heavy how a uh, difficult a load it was but despite all the burden and despite all how burdensome it was physically for him despite all that when there was a suspension when there was fatratul wahi he was grieved he was upset he was in a state of distress shows all what his love love of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the love for the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the desire the desire to stay connected with quran the desire to receive and to learn the messages of quran and the commandments of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to desire the desire to learn about the right path to jannah because that is what quran was instructing too the desire to learn the righteous path of life the path to jannah and to pass it on to people that is also what, what what was one of his concerns and desires now stopping here we need to ask all ourselves questions do we love allah subhanahu wa taala all that much do we love prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and do we have the desire to connect with quran to that extent and when our connection with quran is disrupted for some days for few reasons for some reasons do we feel that upset or are we grieved if we disconnect with quran due to some unforeseen reasons allahumma inni as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba man yuhibbuka wa amal allazi yuballighuni hubbaka <clears throat> and the basic themes of this of the surah and the basic subject matter of the surah is that um, after the intermission of the revolution it was assumed the first seven verses of the surah they were revealed in these 
Prophet Sallallahu was commanded for the first time to arise and to warn the people of the consequences of the way of life they were following against, against the orders of Allah. And uh, then Prophet Sallallahu was also instructed that his life should be pure in all forms. It should be pure in all respects. And he should carry out the duty of reforming the people with sincerity, irrespective of any worldly gains. And he should endure with uh, patience. And then in the next few verses, Prophet Sallallahu when he started to start preaching because in the right in the first few verses he was ordered to start openly preaching and spreading his message so what happened next was that when prophet Salavarism started preaching out openly and started to recite the quranic verses uh, which he was revealing he started reciting the quranic verses then people of mecca they got alarmed they were alarmed and they were upset because they knew that there will be there will be a penetration of all these verses they knew how effective they were and they knew how pious the manner of prophet sallallahu how effective it was and so they started raising opposition and they started raising hostility and the people of mecca they feared that if prophet sallallahu he started visiting the caravans of the pilgrims coming from all over um, arabia and uh, they, he would go to them and they, he would recite the spell binding revolutions of the Quran in the assemblies at the occasion of Hajj, then his, his message would spread like the jungle fire. So fearing all this, they held a conference and they all, get to go, they all got together and they uh, decided, they started saying that they need to come to a consensus of opinion, how they need to oppose these teachings and they need to prevent the teachings of Prophet Sallallahu get to all the pilgrims so that it might not spread to the whole of Arab. So what happened is during the conference, Walid bin Mughera, he addressed the assembly and he said that if you say contradictory things about Prophet Sallallahu we will all lose our trust among the people. So if one person coming up with one acquisition and the other person coming up with another acquisition, so we coming up with contradictory things, we will lose our trust among the people and our acquisitions will not have any effect. So what we need to do is we need to make a consensus and we need to agree upon one opinion which we are going to come up with against our defaming techniques of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi some people said that uh, they, uh, he said that they, they, uh, they call, they will call Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a soothsayer. And he immediately said that, no, by God, he is not a soothsayer. We, we've been seeing soothsayers and what they murmur and what they utter, they, it has no remotest of resemblance to what Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is presenting as Quran. And then there are other people who said that uh, we can say that he is a person who is possessed he is insane and he is mad. Walid bin Mughera said, you know that he is not a possessed person. And uh, if you say that he is possessed, he's insane, and uh, you blame him with all that, with a person who's been, who has been always uh, called as a, a sadiq and al-Amin and know what his reputation is, people will not believe what you are saying. Then people say, uh, said that well, let's just call him as a poet. Tell people that he is a poet and all what he's presenting is the poetry. Walid bin Mughera, he negated that also. He said that, no, he's not a poet. For we know what poetry is and we know all forms of poetry. And what he presents, he confirms nothing to all forms of poetry. We will not get away by saying all that. And then they suggested that we might start calling him as a sorcerer. And he said that he is not a sorcerer either. We've been seeing sorcerers and we know also what methods, what filthy methods they adopt for sorcery. And this will not apply to Prophet Sallallahu also. And then he said, whichever of these things you said about him, it would be, it, it would be taken as a false acquisition. By God, his speech is sweet, his root is deep, and his branches are fruitful. And then um, Abu Jahal was urging him to convince people to say, come up to one thing or the other. And finally, he said that, okay, fine. If we have to come up with any defaming techniques and any acquisition, then I think the nearest thing to the truth is that you start telling the people of Arabs that he is a sorcerer. 
And you can come up and say that he has brought a message. He has brought a message by which he separates a man from his father, uh, a man from his father, from his brother, from his wife, from his children, and from his family. And then there was a consensus, and they all agreed what Walid bin Mughera had proposed. And they said that we will label Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a sorcerer. And he, he tells us such a, certain verses which cause separation of the beloved ones of the family. So now agreeing to all that, they appointed people and people were taught and they were appointed and they were paid to do the task. And they used to, all these people of Quraysh, they, they're appointed people and individuals, they used to go to all the camps of the pilgrims and they used to inform them that within our community of Mecca is now a sorcerer. So you need to stay away from him and all the incantations and all the verses he, go, he recites to you, stay away from them. Because if you happen to listen to them, then the magic will work at you and he will mesmerize you and he will get you into a spell and that will lead to breaking of your beloved bonds. So you know what actually happened with all this? What actually happened with all this was assisting the mission and the preaching of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ended up in assisting Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, because if Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam all by himself, by foot, walking from one camp to the other, knocking at door from one door to the other, just by his word of mouth. If he had tried to preach and spread and invite all the people, it would have been like impossible, humanly impossible for him to reach out to all the pilgrims. But this work was made easy for him by all the agents of the Quraysh themselves. They would go about, a huge party of all the people of Quraysh would go about to all the camps of the pilgrims and they would, they were indirectly introducing Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to all of them. And you know what, when somebody's asked to stop from something or to refrain from something or to stay away from something, that it is always a human instinct that a sense of curiosity definitely develops. So all these people of Quraysh, they assisted the invitation of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam themselves by reaching out to all the people of all the pilgrims and it actually introducing Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to them and raising a curiosity and sense of curiosity among all of them. So they try out and find out and locate and reach to the sorcerer themselves and find out whether what they are saying is true or not. So this is what? This is the help of Allah. This is the help of Allah. Exactly is the same way which I was, I related to you as uh, all the sources and the resources and the powers and the enemy and the soldiers of the Pharaoh, they turned out helpful and supportive for Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. So similarly, the people of Quraysh, they turned out supportive for Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. This is the help of Allah. It accompanies those who are obedient, who are patient, and who are reliant on Allah. And this is what? This is the plan of Allah. What happens is what Allah plans. And what Allah plans, it is only that which succeeds. Makaru wa makarullah. And when Allah plans something, then he is the best planner. We just need to rely and depend and wait for his plans and for the completion of his plans and pray and supplicate and invoke that his plans be helpful and supportive for us. We never need to fear any enemy. We never need to, need to fear any tyrant, any oppressor, any persecutor, because it will not be their plans which will be conducted. It will be the plans of Allah. We need to supplicate for help of his plans. And remember, when Allah plans something, he creates conditions, resources, environments, optimum for the conduction of his plans. And remember, and remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created resources for all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the sources and conditions for the implementation of the teachings of Quran during the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, despite the fact that all the mushrikun were disliking it and were they, they were putting all their efforts to put a stop to it. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here in these verses, Allah is going to narrate the order which was given after the revolution resumed after a period of Fatratul Wahi. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhal muddathiru kum fa'anzir wa rabbaka fa'kabbir wa thiyabaka fa'tuakhir wa rudza fa'hjur wa la tamnun tastaksur wa li rabbika fa'sbir. Allah says, O you who covers himself with a garment, arise and warn. This was like the first time when Prophet وسلم, was asked to do what? He was asked before this, the messages and invitation of Prophet وسلم, were all concealed and very secretively his invitation was being conducted. But now he was ordered that you get up and fa'anzir, you warn the people. Oh, you who, who is who lies unwrapped and who stands up and you arouse the people. Arouse the people for what? You warn them. You warn them of the fate which they will certainly overtake if they remain involved in the same heedless manners of their life. Warn them. Warn them that they are not living in a lawless kingdom. Warn them that they are not free to conduct themselves as they like and whatever and wherever they please without fearing of any form of accountability. So they were they were told to be warned of the accountability, warned of their meeting with their Lord, warned with the torments of hellfire, which they will not be able to escape if they prefer to stay in a state of disbelief. Arise and warn. And then in the verse three, Allah says, and your Lord, you should glorify. Remember, all the prophets, all the messengers, and all those inviting the bondsmen towards the recognition and towards the obedience of the creator of the universe, they need to introduce not their own magnanimity, not their own greatness, not their own superiority, but the superiority, but the glorification, but the exaltedness and the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. The foremost duty, the foremost duty of all those who are associated with the mission of teaching and preaching of Quran is to refute the greatness of all those whom the ignorant people believe in the greatness of and to proclaim the true greatness of Allah Almighty. This is the duty of all those who are involved in the teaching and preaching of Quran. And that is what Allahu Akbar. This phrase of Allahu Akbar is so very important. That is why it has been placed in Azan repeatedly in the proclamation of Salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Muslims enter the prayer saying what? Allahu Akbar. In every act, changing act of the Salah, we, we say what? Allahu Akbar. We slaughter our animals saying what? Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. We start going around the haram for tawaf, starting saying what? Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. So this is importance of announcing and of declaring and of proclaiming the, the glory of Allah himself. Verse number four was siyabaka fatwahir and your clothings, they keep them purified, and five, and uncleanliness you should avoid. This is what, these were the two instructions which were given to Prophet ﷺ right at the start of his prophethood. Right at the start of his, the initial part, initial years of his prophethood, he has been given two instructions to keep his clothing purified, purified and to avoid all forms of uncleanlinesses and impurities. Because why? As we learn by a tradition, iman, that half of the belief and faith is what? Is in purification. And we learn from a verse of Surah Al-Baqarah that Allah says, Inna wa wa There is for sure that Allah loves those who seek forgiveness and who repent and who keep themselves pure. So that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering Prophet that he needs to keep his garments free 
free from all, number one, from all forms of physical filth and all forms of in, impurity. Because you know what? A believer, a believer has is supposed to have a pure spirit. And if the body and if the garments are impure, then these things will not be able to coexist. So for a pure spirit, we need to have, and we need to maintain a pure body and pure garments as well. We need to keep our body clean and we need to keep our body clean, performing wudu and taking the obligatory baths of purification well in time. And not only this, we need to keep our, our dress clean our dress clean from physical forms of filth and dust and impurities and all forms of dirty, filthy, impure things. But we need to keep our dresses also clean from all forms of garments, clean from all forms of moral impurities also. Moral impurities like a dress of arrogance, a dress of wastefulness, or a dress of extravagance, a dress which is worn just for the cause or the source of Ria exhibition, demonstration, a pompous dress worn off, worn to show off, a dress of pride, a dress of vanity, or a dress which resembles, which resembles the non-Muslims, or a dress of a Muslim woman resembling the men, or a dress of Muslim men resembling like women. So this is what these are the filth and the moral filths which we need to uh, refrain from in our garments also. The dress of the person who is calling the people towards Allah should be like what? Should be like a dress of piety, should be clean, pure, respectable, honorable, and should be, should be modest, should not be immoral, should not be vulgar, should not be, um, should be what? Should be a dress which should be respectable and at the same time, it should be a dress of piety. And not only should we need to keep our dress and our garments and our body clean, we should need to keep our companions, our friendships, our environments also clean. We need to keep our houses and environment clean and we need to purify. We need to purify our gaze, what we look, what we hear, and we need to purify our conversation our tongue, we need to save it from foul conversations. We need to purify our conversation from all forms of backbitings and telling lies and slander and mocking and taunting and all ill manners. We need to keep our manners purified also. And we need to purify our souls and our hearts. We need to keep our hearts and souls pure from all forms of love and lust of the worldly wealth and riches, from all forms of arrogance and pride and vanity, from all forms of mutual grievances and grudges and harsh and hard feelings, and then from all forms of envy and all forms of jealousy, and from all evil and sinful desires do we need to purify our hearts and souls. So Allah says, Keep away from all forms of uncleanliness and do not confer favor to acquire more. But for your Lord, be patient. And when the trumpet is blown, the day will be a difficult day. For the disbeliever is not easy. Leave me. Leave me with the one I created alone. So from here, verses number 11 to 21, uh, 25, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about Walid bin Mughera. Allah will mention the status, the blessings he was blessed with. And in response to all the blessings and the worldly status, his behavior, his mannerism, the plans he was playing against Prophet Wasallam, And finally, will Allah mention the, the punishment for this, um, for this person who was trying to play dirty and filthy pranks against Prophet Wasallam. Allah says, leave me. Leave me with the one I created alone and to whom I granted extensive wealth. He was like one of the richest men in Makkah and children present with him. We learn with traditions that he had 12 sons all around him all the time and children present and spread everything before him, easing his life. Then 
He desires that I should add more. No, indeed, he has been towards our verses obstinate. I will cover him with arduous torment. Indeed, he thought and deliberated. This was all. This is with reference to what happened in the conference of the believers of uh, disbelievers of Makkah, where the final consensus of opinion was suggested by Walid bin Mughera himself that we should, uh, we will announce that Prophet is what? Nauzubillah, a sorcerer. Indeed, he thought and deliberated. So may he be destroyed for who, for how he deliberated. Then may he be destroyed for how he deliberated. Then he considered again. Then he frowned and scowled then he turned back and was arrogant and he said this is not but magic imitated from others this is not but the word of a human being i will drive him into succor and what can make you know what succor is it lets nothing remain. This is what a, a pit of the hell. It lets nothing remain and leaves nothing unburned, blackening the skins. Over it are 19 angels, and we have not made the keepers of fire except angels, and we have not made their number except as a trial for those who disbelieve that those who were given the scriptures will be convinced, and those who have believed in increase will increase in faith, and those who were given the scripture and the believers will not doubt, and that those in whose hearts is hypocrisy, and this and the disbelievers will say, what does Allah intend by this example? Which example? Having nine angels over the hell fire. The disbelievers will say, what does Allah intend by this as an example? Thus, does Allah lead astray whom he wills and guides whom he wills? And none knows the soldiers of your Lord except him. And mention of the fire is not but a reminder to humanity. Here in this verse number 31, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning, has made mention of 19 angels, the guarding angels of hellfire. And Allah says that this is a trial for the disbelievers. This mention is a trial for the disbelievers. And how did this all happen? You know, when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he uh, mentioned about these 19 keepers of hellfire, the people of Mecca, they started mocking and they started making fun of all this. And they started mocking what Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, saying that how strange, how strange that on one hand, we have been told they just all used to sit together and they used to mock and they used to make fun of this uh, verse of Quran and the information given to them by Prophet Sallallahu and they used to say in quote, they used to say that how strange it is that on one hand, the Quran tells us that all the human beings from the time of Prophet Adam salam to the day of resurrection, they, they will be collected and all those who, who will disbelieve and they will commit evil, they will be collected and they will be cast into hell. And on the other hand, here we are told that there will be just 19 keepers. There will be just 19 keepers who will administer punishment to all, the, all of them, to all the countless number of people in such huge number in such a huge hell. So they, they, this caused them a huge laughter. And you know what Abu Jahl and other people said? Abu Jahl said, brothers, he hosted a party and he collected people. And there he announced, he said that, brothers, are you so powerless? Are you so powerless that even as many of 10, 10 of you at a time will not be able to power, overpower a single, a single guard of hell? And there was a wrestler who came up and he said very proudly, he said in vanity, he said, well, I will deal with all. I will deal with and I will overpower at least 17 of them by myself. And as far for the remaining two, you can all together, you can tackle with them and we will overpower them and we will come out of hell. Astaghfirullah Rabbi, Astaghfirullah Rabbi, how arrogance and how stubbornness can lead to disbelief. And then actually, you know, it was, it was actually foolish on their part. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to tell them that it is foolish on your part to compare the powers of the angels with human powers. 
and thinking that human beings are in hellfire, the inmates of hellfire, they will be able to overpower the angels guarding the hell. How foolish of them. So this was exactly why this verse was revealed that listening to this, the believers, they will increase their, their fear of hellfire and their fear of um, the day of, uh, of the hereafter. But those who believe, who disbelieve, they will tend to stick to their arrogance and their stubbornness, and they will stick to their state of, uh, of uh, disbelief in their hereafter and disbelief in the hellfire also. Allah says, no, by the moon and by the night when it departs, Allah is swearing by the night and Allah is swearing by the moon. And by the morning when it brightens, indeed the fire is of the greatest afflictions and is a warning to humanity and to whoever wills among you to proceed or to stay behind. Every soul for whatever it has earned will be retained except the companions of the right who will be in gardens questioning each other and about the criminals. So when the people of Jannah, when the people of Jannah, they will ask, they will ask the people of hellfire, what got you into hell? The people of Jannah, they will ask the criminals of hellfire, they will ask them, what put you into succor? What got you into succor? What will they come up with? They will say, Lam al -musallin. we were not of those who prayed. We were not of those who prayed. So salah it is. My sisters, my daughters, salah it is. Players establishing prayers it is, which will help people, which will help save people from, their, from the torments of grave, which will help save people from the torments of the day of judgment, will, which will help people to have easy accountability, answer their first question on the day of judgment, which will help people to run through on the bridge of Sarat with their nur of Salah, and which will help people to enter their palace of Jannah with their miftahul Jannah, the key to Jannah, and which will no doubt save the people from hellfire. They will say, we were not of those who prayed, nor did we use to feed the poor. They did not feed the poor. They did not feed the poor and they did not encourage. So today, in today's lesson, we learn repeatedly that to get to Jannah and to save ourselves from hellfire, two deeds which have been repeatedly mentioned is establishing of Salah and attending to the attending to the underprivileged society of the, of, the, of the society. We used to enter into vain discourse with those who engaged in it, and we used to deny the day of recompense until they came to us certainty, and there, and there will, so there will not benefit them the intercession of any intercessors. And then what is the matter with them? That they are from the reminder turning away, as if they were alarmed donkeys fleeing from the lion. Rather, every person among them desires that he would be given a scripture spread about. No, but they do not fear the hereafter. No, indeed, the Quran is a reminder that whoever wills will remember it. And they will not remember except that Allah wills. He is worthy of fear and adequate for granting forgiveness. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wa tuqa wal afafa wal ghina. Rabbi ghfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. Rabbi ghfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. Allahumma hasibna khisabi yasira. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Rabbi ibni li indaka baytan fil janna. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiyu al-aleem. وطب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم آمين سمامين